Welcome to the mini-service of Trinity Episcopal Church in Boonville with the sermon of Mother Linda Logan for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. The music is by Mike Ferris and Terry Marcy. Oh, my God. 
in the name of the one holy God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Amen. Jesus is a challenge. You don't believe that? Look again at this morning's gospel. A lawyer stands up to test Jesus and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. Now, this lawyer isn't a lawyer in the modern sense of the term. He's a person who has studied the law of God and presumably understands what God is telling us in those texts. So, when he asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life, Jesus, knowing that the lawyer asked the question to test him, turns the question back on him. What is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer replies, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer can't leave matters as they lie here, because that would leave the ball in his court. So he throws the ball back to Jesus, asking him to define his term. And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies with the story of the Good Samaritan. A story which, with its surprising choice of hero, puts the lawyer in his place. For the hero isn't someone whom the lawyer would even consider to be a believer. It's a Samaritan, a heretic by Jewish standards, who is the model of neighborly love that Jesus holds up. We miss this important twist when we hear this story. Because of this story, the term Samaritan has come into our language as the definition of a good neighbor. But to the lawyer to whom Jesus spoke, a person who was devoted to understanding and keeping the law of God, a Samaritan was someone who didn't keep the law because the only books of scripture he considered sacred were the first five, the books of the Torah. And in addition to that, he worshipped at Sichem, not Jerusalem. Unless we spend a little time studying scripture, we don't know this fact. And even when we do, we tend to miss its significance. But this would be the same thing as today saying to a Christian of limited experience that a person who was Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist could be living a life that reflected God's love. Think of it. A person who doesn't believe in what you consider to be the right way could, by their actions, live the law of God. This presses the point, doesn't it? Jesus alters the question from, who is my neighbor, to, who proved to be a neighbor to someone else? In the telling of his story, he demonstrates that the law of God is fulfilled when we act as neighbor to those who least expect it. 
having the right faith isn't his concern. Doing the right action is. But doing the right action means seeing the least likely person as neighbor. And that is a statement of faith. That is a statement that God's definition of neighbor is the one that we are to believe and act on. This is difficult to get our minds and hearts around, isn't it? Like the lawyer, what we want to know is how to inherit eternal life. And what Jesus tells us is to take care of the people we would rather avoid. Now, to be fair to the people in Jesus' story, we need to point out that those who passed by the man who had been beaten up and left for dead were technically in the right in terms of the teaching of their religion. For if either the priest or the Levite, a temple administrator, were to touch the man's blood as he cared for him physically, the priest or the Levite would become ritually unclean and be prohibited from entering the temple until he had undergone ritual purification. And before we dismiss this fact as an example of archaic ritual happily left in the past, we need to consider comparable situations. What is prayer supposed to do? It's supposed to open us up to the needs of others so that we can be part of God's healing presence in the world, right? But what if those needs are of people not like us? What if those needs are of people on the other side of the border or on the other side of the world? What if meeting those needs means supporting the efforts of people who hold political or religious convictions different from our own? What if it means contributing funds we had different plans for using? What God asks of us is difficult. But what hangs upon our answer is the kind of presence we are in the world. And here we get to what is really the central point of Jesus' story. Eternal life is not a commodity. It is not something we purchase either with our gifts to the church or our gifts to the world. It is not something to have, to hold on to, to encircle with our arms or our religious or political labels. And it is not something out there beyond the clouds of life we now experience. Eternal life is a way of being in which God's reality permeates all. It is a way of living in which God's hopes and dreams are our way of living, not just our vision, but our actions and interactions everywhere 
and with all persons. The lawyer did give the right answer when Jesus turned the question back on to him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That is the right answer. But Jesus' concluding comment is the directive we mustn't forget. Do this and you will live. Eternal life is in the doing. Do this. Do this to and with the people you would rather walk on by and avoid.
This has been a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church on Schuyler Street in Boonville. Thank you for listening, and we invite you to join us for our weekly services at 9 a.m. Sunday mornings.